Ladies and gentlemen, if you have Bibles, I'm going to go to Matthew 28. If not, you can follow along up here. Okay. Um, Matthew 28, this section started in verse 16. You guys probably know this as the Great Commission. That is all I'll be speaking on tonight. I do work for a missions organization called Format International. Uh, OMF International stands for Overseas Missionary Fellowship. OMF is the largest uh, missionary fellowship that works in East Asia. East Asia being East part of Asia, not including Russia, not including India. Okay. Uh, to give that guys idea what I do, I do mobilization, which is basically leadership development, recruiting missionaries and helping churches get more missionaries. And so that's, that's why tonight I'm talking to you guys about discipleship as missions. Alright, we should set aside <clears throat> when, we, when we think about discipleship and when we think about missions, we think of two different things, right? We think about discipleship as kind of like, okay, I'm going to meet with a guy or a girl once every week and we're going to hang out and talk about the Bible and stuff and we're going to get more holy. Alright? And then if it's a guy, it's like, hey, this week, make sure don't date that girls. Like, right, cool. you know, if it's a girl, it's like, okay, right, don't date that guys. Like, right, cool. yeah. It's like, hey, are you been stealing? No. Okay, this week's over. <laughs> And so, like, discipleship ends up just being, like, behavior change. My mic's like, gone, is it? I'm not talking to the mic. What is it? What discipleship ends up being is basically behavior change. Being a Christian is not about behavior change. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that can change your behavior. If you just want behavior change, you can just take a, take a class on, like, how to be a nice person. I think, I think there actually are classes on how to be a nice person. Okay? Or, if you just want to have a behavior change, you can, like, join a sport team. And you'll have a behavior change. You'll have healthy living habits. What the Christian, the Christian life is about is about being filled with the power of God, knowing Jesus Christ, and following Jesus Christ. And so that's why I'm going to do tonight, as we're in Matthew 28. What I want you to, want you to see is, what is Jesus calling his disciples to do? What does it mean to actually follow Jesus? Because I think if you understand that, we're going to see why... Missions is part of our discipleship journey. Missions is part of becoming more like Jesus. Right? So, Matthew 28, you guys in your Bibles, look up here. Starting in verse 16. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. If you guys in the Bible, you guys know that Matthew 28, 28 the last chapter of Matthew. By, by the 28th chapter, what happens? Jesus has already died. Right? The entire city of Jerusalem, everyone has seen this guy. Die on the cross, the Romans have seen him, the Jews have seen him, he dies on a cross, gets buried, put in a tomb, and three days later he rises again. And he rises and a bunch of people see him and they know like, oh my gosh, this guy has come back from the dead. You know, he should be dead, but he's actually risen and now he's like powers, right? His disciples are meeting in a closed room and he's like going to a closed room or something like that. And he's like teleportation, all kinds of crazy stuff. And so something happens in Jesus' ministry now. And, he, and, I, and I say this because you gotta understand, even though Jesus is God, and he's the Son of God, and he's the Messiah, the, the coming king, he comes into the world as a baby. I know we take that for granted because there's this in America and like that. But think about that. The God of the universe comes as a baby. How is the God of the universe a baby? How is it impossible? Right? Does God even live need to look at a walk? I mean, he created feet. <laughs> I and mean, he created legs on my seven feet and stuff like that. But somehow, when he's a baby, he has to learn to walk. I never thought about that. <laughs> somehow, when he's a baby, he has to learn how to talk. He created language. Or not just language, like animal language, like barking. Okay, he created that. <laughs> but somehow, he has to learn how, how to talk, too. And so, what you see in Jesus' life is that even though he is beginning and the end, his time on earth, he actually has stages of his life. He doesn't start doing ministry until third. So there's some kind of God appointed time that's happening in history. Sometime, you know, 4 BC to like 30 AD, there's something happening where God is actually using the human timeline to accomplish something. So now we're, we're, now we're in a part of his life where he's died and he's risen again. And now if you're disciple of Jesus, you're wondering, okay, what's next? I mean, we grew up with you guys as kids, like we've seen you as a baby, like you learned how to walk and how to talk. And then we saw you die and rise again from the grave. You're the only person in history who has ever died and then come back to life. Right? And then when he comes back to life, he's now glorified. 
There's something about his resurrected body. He still has the, the nails and the holes in his hands. But somehow, he still looks like him. But he can, like, teleport and, like, go through rooms. And, like, it's kind of a weird thing, right? So I'm not sure what's going to happen now. So now he goes back to Galilee. And I point this out because, if you guys can Google this later, is Galilee Jerusalem? Obviously not. Is Galilee Rome? You know what Galilee is? Galilee is actually like a coastal village area. But next slide, I want to show you that. Show what it looks like. All right, that's what Galilee looks like. All right, even like today, it's like not big, very, very big. But Galilee is basically just like plains next to, next to the ocean. It's kind of it's where Jesus grew up. All right, Jesus, Jesus Galilee, Nazareth. All right, it's the region. Galilee is the area. <clears throat> he grows up in Galilee, and he comes back to Galilee. I think that's significant. I think that's significant because he's basically going back to kind of where his life started, where he kind of started his, his journey here on earth. But notice where, where he didn't go. He doesn't, he doesn't go to Jerusalem. Because he could. Because everyone in Jerusalem saw him die and he's rising again, oh my gosh, if he wants to bring the kingdom of God to earth, we're going to start Jerusalem. So he could have said, okay, everyone who loses me, come to Jerusalem, let's give on. All right, he could have done that. And then it would have made sense. So like, if you do the, the king of the Jews, it makes sense to go to Jerusalem. He could have gone to Rome. He's also king of the universe, right? Good enough to go from like, okay, it's also very much game on. Alright, I'm gonna go to the Caesars, I'm gonna let people know who's really the boss. And he can like everyone follows me on the teleport to, to Rome, okay? <laughs> We're gonna do this together. And he can do that, but he doesn't do that. Instead he goes to Galilee. And so if you're if you're if you're thinking like strategically, right? Like, okay, Jesus is just resurrected from the grave. And he's about to launch this important mission. And he launches it in like this little hill, mountainside area, facing the ocean, and there's like only a few people there. I hope that makes you wonder why. I hope that, I hope that when, you, when you look at this text, you're like, why doesn't God do it himself? Why doesn't God just go to Jerusalem and establish this as king? Why doesn't God just go to Rome and tell all the people who don't even have a Bible, they didn't even heard of Jesus in Nazareth, they don't know the law of Moses, who God is? And so he goes to a remote place, right? Like he's basically his hometown. And he says, the mission starts here. <clears throat> Christ, God himself is the head of the church. But the body of God is you guys. Right? The people sitting in this room is the Christians throughout the entire history. God uses people to accomplish his purposes. Right? And that's why the church is called the body of Christ. Right? The body of Christ. Meaning that God the head tells us where to go, but he actually uses people. And so who, who, instead of going to Jerusalem, you know who goes to Jerusalem? Peter goes to Jerusalem. Instead of going to Rome, who goes to Rome? Paul goes to Rome. And so he uses the individuals throughout the church to accomplish his purposes. That's how mission starts. Mission starts because God himself, when he resurrects, he goes to Galilee. Galilee, by the way, just, if you guys reference, you guys know Galilee, it's like Fresno. I don't know if you guys know. <laughs> That's the closest to like, I think of Fresno, all right? So you go to Fresno. You go to Fresno, and it's like, all right, some of you go to LA, some of you go to SF, but Fresno's not our stop. <laughs> and then we'll go back to heaven. And he does that, and he comes to the places where we are. The places that, you know, kind of just home for you guys. Like, this was his, his home. But he's calling people from their homes to go out to the nations. That's how we know God is God of missions. Next slide. Alright, so verse 17. And so when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted him. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And when they saw him, they worshipped a son of David. Take this picture in your mind, okay? <clears throat> Jesus dies on the cross. Hundreds of people see him. Three thousand people see him. He rises from, from the grave. Now he can teleport. Now he can like go crazy, like hold his hands. He doesn't bleed out his hands now. Right? <clears throat> he calls them to come to the mountain, right, Galilee. And some people are like, oh my gosh, this guy's pulls in his hand, he's not bleeding. <laughs> and he's like, he's still physically here, he's not a ghost, like, praise God, singing songs. And some are like, alright, whatever. Some doubt him. How do you, how do you 
doubt it. Someone with holes in his hands if he teleports. I don't think they doubt that he's real, all right? Because obviously he's, he's real. I don't think they doubt he has power. Because obviously, if you don't believe in your hands, there's some kind of power. If you resurrect, if you raise from the dead, there's some kind of power. So what are they actually doubting? Because some are, some are worshiping him. And so it's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not insane. Right? I mean, he's physically there. So what are they actually doubting? I think what they're doubting is, who is this guy? And what is, what is he doing? Is he just some prophet with power? Because if you're, if you're a Jew, right, you knew that some of the prophets had power. Some of the prophets would call down fire from heaven and do all this stuff. And so you, I think what you're wondering is, does Jesus actually have power? Because I know he's physically there, I know he exists, but who, is he, is he who he says he is? Or is he, is he just Elijah? Or is he just that second coming of you know, John the Baptist or resurrected somehow? <clears throat> the Christian question is not, I don't think, is whether God exists. If you're, if you're in this room, I don't think the question for you is, is that God exists. I think the question is, do you believe Jesus for who he says he is? Because there's a kind of spectator Christianity. So if you look at this, spectator Christianity, it's like, you guys all grow, go to like FNX, and Jesus is FNX. And, you got, and some are like worshiping, and some are like, I don't know about this, man. Like, I know we're all saying this, but it's kind of, what's going on here? What spectator Christianity is, is you mentally acknowledge that God exists. Just like these guys. I mean, you have to mentally acknowledge God exists. It's in front of you, physically. But what spectator Christianity is, is that you don't believe in the power of God. That you don't believe that God is who he says he is. Because if you believe God is who he says he is, look at the next verse. It says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. And you have to believe that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. Here's the implication of that. The implication of that to the people on the mountain is this. Everything you will ever, ever need for the rest of your life is accomplished by God. Through Jesus' life, what is it shown? Turns water into wine. He changed substances. Right. At parties, we're embarrassed and change stuff, maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay? When he goes to, when he goes, when people are hungry, thousands of people, you know, by the sea, they're hungry, he can turn loaves of, like, two, two fish and point them to loaves of food for everybody. He can feed you. You'll never go hungry again. He heals people of diseases and, you know, physical disabilities that they have their entire lives. He can heal you. No matter how broken you are, he can heal you. Even if your last week you die, he can raise you from the dead. You will never, ever, ever, ever need anything in life again if you follow Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And you're like, cool. I'll believe that. And now if you believe that, then this is what it means for us. There should be no more anxiety in our lives. I don't know what you're thinking about this weekend or the next week and all the stresses you have. But as a Christian, if you fully believe in this, you should be no stresses. Right? If you believe God can do everything, then you basically believe that I, don't, I, I will ace every task, I will always have a job, I will never you know, be in a situation that God can overcome. It was kind of interesting. Um, so, so Yahoo released their new web design, right? And I was looking at their web design. And apparently Yahoo Astrologer is like on the front page now. Because apparently it's one of the most, one of the most popular things that happened with Yahoo Astrologer. Okay, people really want to know, like, this week, you will meet someone friendly, and you will have a conversation with <laughs> this, and then have the knowledge. But you know, it got me thinking, why is that? Why is that? Why is Yahoo Astrology one of the popular things? I think all of us, you know, especially not Christians, but we, we have this desire to know what's next in our lives. Right? We have, we have a desire, like, not just like, who are we going to marry, what kind of job we might have, but like, what's going to happen this week? Am I going to meet someone friendly and have a good conversation? <laughs> but we have this anxiety about the future. We have this anxiety about, well, oh man, I'm not sure if I'm going to be happy two years from now, or like if I'm going to have friends, or if my family's going to be with me. The Christian life starts with this all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. Jesus is telling his disciples this if you truly want to believe me, not just as a prophet, you have, to, you have to believe this about God, that all authority in the heaven and earth has been given to him. If you 
follow Jesus, you will have every single thing that you need. He will lead you down every single road you need to go down. And then every single thing in your life, He will be doing. And this is the hard person. So verse 19. Therefore go, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Here's something interesting. I just said, everyone here on the mountain, you know, included, been do, doing two things, either worshiping or they're down. But he's saying to both groups, therefore go, make disciples of all nations. I, I want to I say, say this first, okay? <clears throat> Being a missionary does not mean all of a sudden all your all your issues are gone. That you'll never doubt Jesus again. That yet you you'll always trust God for your future. That doesn't that does not necessarily mean you know fair truth because we just saw the verse. Some doubt he's talking to them. So if that's the case, why is he why is he talking? Now what does he mean when he talks to everybody? Therefore go. I think following God is part of how we get to know God. And we know that's true because how does God teach his disciples when, he, when he's here on earth? He has them all of them, right? He's going around healing people, he's going around preaching, he's going around giving food away. He's having them all of them and say, watch what I'm doing. I'm going out to different people groups, going to Samaritans, right? Going to people you don't normally associate with, and I'm, you know, having dinner with them. I'm healing them of their diseases. When they need teaching, I'm teaching them. And so he's saying, like, you know, and as you're going with me, you're learning. That's how you learn. You, you learn by going. And so now when he goes to heaven, he's like, same thing. Same thing. Right? In the same way that when I was on earth, you guys follow me, you know, to like go to people, like, hey, okay, watch me pray for this person, person gets healed. Same thing. Now that we go to heaven, same thing. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is not behavior change. Right? He just, he just didn't say that, okay, now before I go, make sure, don't date shady people. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, before I go, I know you want to make money, be careful, be rich. You could say those things. And most of our discipleship ends up being that way. Most of our discipleship ends up just being like, okay, let's not do bad things. Okay, don't sleep around. Don't get people. Alright, don't be a jerk. But what Jesus says, you know what discipleship is? It's following Jesus. And to follow Jesus is that. It's to therefore go and to make disciples. In the same way that Jesus went out to different people groups, right? People that people don't normally associate with, and he shared with them the gospel. But he didn't just talk at them, right? He didn't talk at them. He also healed them, made food for them, cared for them and their needs. In that same way, therefore go. Make disciples of all nations. Okay, and that, that word is key. All, that word nations, by, by the way, just so you know what it means. Does it mean countries? Because if it does, you got a problem. How many countries are there in the world? Like one big one. Right? <laughs> Rome. Okay, Rome controls like most of the world at that point. So you can't you can't mean countries, because that's pretty weak to manage. Okay? It's like go to Rome and the two other countries that are small around us. <clears throat> that word nation actually means people groups. So people groups, the way you look at people groups is a people group has its own specific language, culture, and history. So this is an easy one. So is China one people group? Or Chinese one people group? Obviously, it can't be. It's 1.4 billion people. They're not all the same. Alright? That's why if you, you know, if you have family members who are Asian, you know that there's huge amount of language barriers, right? Even among relatives sometimes. Right? So my, my family is Chinese. My wife, Carmen, her family is Cantonese. Um, I think Carmen's family also they all speak Mandarin. Right? But they have to speak Mandarin. You can't speak. Carmen's family can't see most of the time. They can't be can't see my parents because they'll have no idea what's going on. Alright. But there's this separation here. I mean the Chinese people are, are kind of similar to each other. But like if, if, if your parents are Vietnamese and your other parents are Chinese, obviously you see the, the barrier here, right? So people groups have either a cultural barrier, a language barrier, or like a historical barrier. That's why you need to go. There's a there's a going involved because there's some kind of barrier you have to cross. Because if, if following Jesus just meant they go to San Diego, there's a problem, because then most people would never hear the gospel. Okay, because a lot of people don't speak English. And so when Jesus is saying go, he's saying, hey, by the way, you might have to learn language. By the way, you might have to learn a new culture. Okay, you can't stay in Fresno forever. 
Okay, you're invited to the Fresno. You can't stay in Fresno forever. Alright, the fish is good, the beef might be good here. Okay, you can't stay here forever. Go on to all the nations. And to make disciples of all nations. <clears throat> Think about the word disciples. What I just say. Making disciples is not behavior change. It's not behavior change. You don't go to China and be like, okay guys, now, don't date shady people. Alright, I don't know what's shady here, but once I learn it, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna tell you what's shady. <clears throat> when we make disciples here, when we understand what make disciples is here, we go do that in the too. So this is what I mean. So <clears throat> I go to Shanghai about twice a year. Alright, this church goes to Shanghai. There's a guy, Justin Song Chan, if you guys don't know him, you could go get his email sometime. Justin Song Chan right now is in Shanghai. What is he doing there? He's doing a lot of what he does here. Right? When he was, in, when he was here at Harvest in San Diego, he knew with college students, read the Bible with them, share life with them, take them to fellowship, and help them to, to grow. Right? To grow as a Christian. How, how does he do that in China? Meet up with people, read the Bible together, pray with them, and help them to grow as a Christian. What, what missions basically is, is that missions is basically, what do you, we, how do you church here? Bring to another culture, but, ha, but learn how they do it. Learn it in their language, learn it in their culture. Obviously, in China, we don't have big metro malls like this. We have like, small houses like 100 square feet. <laughs> but you learn how to do it in their culture, you learn how to do it in their language. <clears throat> I want to reduce how scary missions is to you guys. Alright, because I think, I think for some of us, we think missions is like this crazy, like, jungle, like, cut down, like, this weed, and like, okay, I'm gonna get to this village and, like, share the gospel. What, what missions really is, is what you do here as church. In another language, in another culture. So yes, it's hard. It's hard because learning a language and culture is not easy. All right, if you have, you know, grandparents something like that who don't speak your language, you know how hard that is. Okay, it's not easy to cross the language and culture. So yes, that's why people think like missionaries are holy because they're patient, basically. Okay, they just don't give up. But I want, I want to tell you this: <clears throat> missions is not for super Christians. It's not for super Christians. And honestly, now, you know, some of you guys think like, you have to call me, call me be a missionary. Honestly, what the calling is is two weeks, man. Okay, I don't know what kind of calling that is. <laughs> All right, most, missions for most of you guys is like two weeks in another country. And, and sometimes, countries you've been to, right? Some of you guys have been to Asia. So I don't know what kind of calling you need to have to go to your home, your home country for two weeks. But I'm gonna tell you, I don't see in the Bible anywhere, so you can find it and tell me. I really encourage you guys, if you guys have a heart to share Jesus with people, right? If you're excited about what we do here and we want to do that in another country, that's what mission is. I agree. If you want to do it for you know five years, you want to do it for a career, then you need to call me because then you got to go to seminary and do different things. But that first step, basically what it is, is just this got to be wrong. That first step basically is I want to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus means to go where he's, he's going. And so in the same way Jesus fed people, in the same way Jesus taught people, in the same way Jesus healed people, I want to do that. And he didn't, Jesus didn't stay in Fresno, you know, he didn't stay in San Diego. And so I want to do that too. If you went out, I'm going to go out too. Right? Go out to all nations. That has been in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I want to give you guys an example of someone who did that. Next slide. St. Thomas, there's an entry. You guys remember, when Jesus appears to the disciples who walked in the room praying, one disciple called Doubter Thomas, right? He's like, I won't believe until you let me see the holes in your hands. Right, when the nails went through. Show me that, and I'll know that you're actually not a ghost. And so Thomas comes up, okay, you're real. You're not bleeding, somehow it's sealed, somehow you won't have a cardiovascular system anymore. <clears throat> Interesting about Thomas. Thomas is one of those people, remember, some worship, some doubted. Thomas is one of those who doubted. Here's the interesting thing. He's talking about the future of Thomas now. What he's doing in that picture? <clears throat> you guys know where Jerusalem is, right? Jerusalem is in the Middle East. Thomas goes to India. Okay, there, there, are, there are ancient churches in India. And if you're going to India and you wonder why, like, I have no churches here. Like, India is a long way away from Jerusalem. Thomas is part of tradition. Alright, Thomas is one of the first missionaries to India. Go <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> this is an ancient church in India. I didn't look like much. It was like just a little hobble on the ground. But that's what it is. Okay. Ancient Christianity is not some glorious thing. It's just some like little small building, right? Sometimes it's getting in the way because it's persecution. 
and also because of war, so they kind of just build up this whole rock top army. <coughs> I bring Thomas because 2,000 years removed, we make these, we make, sometimes we make Jesus' disciples seem like super Christians. 2,000 years removed, we make them seem like people, they're so different than us, you know? Like, they, they were like, can't come out of the womb as a hero. They came out of the world as like super buff. They were just like hang out at Rick. They're like, you can do all these places because they're so buff. Jesus' disciples messed up just like we do. Jesus' disciples had a growth in their Christian walks just like we do. What I'm trying to tell you is that part of your Christian walk is following Jesus to places like India. If you really want to grow as a Christian, you can't just have behavior change. It's not like, no. You know, I think about, like, you know, man, who do I really respect? Oh, I really respect John. You know why? Because he doesn't date shady people. <laughs> yes, then that, that's what super holiness looks like. He doesn't do bad things. <laughs> what, what's what spirituality and Christianity really looks like is a person who believes in the power of God. Right? As a person who looks, who looks above circumstances and sees the power of God in everything. So that when, when disaster strikes, when cancer hits your family, when people get really sick, you, you still mourn, you still feel the pain of it. But you're not just trusting in medical science anymore. You're trusting in the God who can heal. When you can't find a job, right, you're not, you're not just trusting in unemployment, like offices and help you find a job. That's important, you gotta, you gotta still work. But at the end of the day, you don't trust that I can kind of implore to employ me. You're basically trusting, like, God, I will always have a job. Because I will always have a problem. And as long as I'm calling, I'll have a job. Believing in the power of God, believing that God is a God who leads your life. That's what Christianity is. So for Thomas, that meant is what he knew. Thomas like, I still have doubts. I know, I was like, the guy who always remembered the scripture for not believing and had some holes in his hands. Why would I do? Because that's what takes me to grow. And again, look, if you guys think about going on missions, you gotta start sending the missionaries from this church, okay? Going overseas doesn't make you super Christian. But you know, you know what you will notice, though, especially guys, some guys who are older. You will notice that as people overseas, because what happens to their spiritual walks, it gets deeper and more mature. Not that it's by accident, okay? I don't think it's by accident that when people go overseas and start serving missions, they get more mature and they start growing spiritually. That's not by accident. When I first came to college, <clears throat> um, I, 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 I Think about like all my dreams and stuff like that that I wanted to accomplish. And he says to me, you know, you know, like, that's when I high school, you're like, okay, man, I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna be a stud, I'm gonna like, be great, I'm gonna get an awesome job, I'm gonna be like so rich, I'm gonna be so cool. <clears throat> you know, see, let's have a secret. My, my two dreams came out of college. One, I wanna be a rock star. <laughs> and two, I wanna become a bodybuilder and like be super famous. Only one of those dreams came true. But, <laughs> I think, I think when, we're, when we're young, you know, like we have these dreams that are really selfish. You know, I want to be a rock star, I thought that was so cool, it's like big money, and to play music, and it's like, yeah, like, everyone knows who I am, and stuff. And I'll tell you, this is how, this is how mission matured me. Going to Shanghai, working with the house churches there, working with people from other provinces, right, from provinces coming to Shanghai, and talking with them. I'm like, why don't you come to Shanghai? Like, oh, because well, my family's really poor, you know, I don't, I'm just here to find a job, you know. Uh, I just want to make, like, a dollar an hour, and I can, so, be my family the next day. And then I talked to them about Jesus. Like, have you ever heard of the Bible? You know, people know who Jesus is? And they're like, oh, what's that? And taking people through scripture and helping them to accept Christ and start growing in the church. So that you see them first find a community, and that community helps them to find a job, and that community helps them to have a, you know, a place where they can share their frustrations with in the city. And to see them mature as Christians, so trusting in Christ, not just in their paycheck. And when I come back to the U.S., I'm like, does it really matter if I'm a rock star? Does me being a rock star feed anybody? Does me being a rock star help someone hear about Jesus? So what happened to me? Things started to change. I started to mature out of it. That's what I'm saying. Mission set. This is part of discipleship. It doesn't make you super Christian by being over there, but by experiencing things, by going where Jesus is going, it helps you mature. Next slide. Teaching them to obey everything that's commanded you and ensure that they have to be always very engaged. And teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. When you go, when you go out as your, as your Christian leader, you teach people 
everything that Jesus has commanded you. One example, who, who in here is part of a small group fellowship or a discipleship relationship? Put your hands. Small groups? Okay, good amount of you. And I know some of you guys are leaders in, in those small groups and fellowships and such relationships. Can I encourage you? What Jesus taught was not behavior change. Okay? What Jesus taught was not behavior change. What Jesus taught was have faith in God. Have faith in God, and when you work, work for the kingdom of God. And when you pray, you praise God, right? You confess your sins, and then you, you ask God, right? You ask God to forgive sins of others. <laughs> if we are to teach everything that Jesus has commanded us, right? We see one of the commandments right there. Therefore, go and disciple us. If you guys want to be a good small group leader, if you guys want to be a good disciple, you guys can add this to your Christian maturity process, okay? You have to teach people to be serious about missions. And the way I mean that is this. You have to teach people to be serious about sharing the gospel with people that are not in their media circle. Because it doesn't take a super spiritual Christian to be nice to your friends. It really doesn't. I can take, I can take like a three day old Christian and I'm be like, make sure you be a Christian to your friends. I'm like, okay, cool. All right, that doesn't take any kind of spiritual growth. The growth happens when you have to share who Jesus is with a, when a person of a different age, right? That becomes a barrier. A different culture, that becomes a barrier. A different language, that's a, that becomes a real big barrier. That's when growth happens. And as you start doing that, as you start going to the hard places, that's when the person has to mature. Right? If you want to teach people how to, how to spend their money well, you don't understand how you do that, you take them to the homeless. Then you start really how to spend money well. Right, when I, my, my first day in college, um, I, I, when I was working in, you know, when I was in the grants, I got a paycheck every month. When you're 17 years old, you get a paycheck every month, it's crazy times. <laughs> it's the time goes like every week. <clears throat> what really changed my life, honestly, was going to downtown San Diego. Some of you guys have been there, I know. You guys just talk cars. <laughs> when I went to downtown San Diego, talk to some of the homeless people there. Talk about how they lost their life. And, and, and help me understand the context of which I was in. Because before that, I thought, oh, I'm just, everyone's like me, everyone has money, you know, we're sending you money, you know, driving cars around for money, five dollars. <clears throat> it wasn't until I hung out with them, they gave me context, right? I'm like, is that really why I don't spend my money? You know, I said, don't have food, not too much of it, should I be sharing with them? <clears throat> to understand the gospel. To a 17 year old, you know, Christian, what the gospel is, God helps me on the test. Alright, God helps me get a job. And it's not until I started hanging out with people who come from broken families, right? Some of my friends in the Marines are going through divorces, they're about 22, going through divorce, have two kids. The gospel became bigger <laughs> right, than getting a job and getting a college degree. How do I share the gospel with someone who's going through a divorce? That helps me understand the gospel more. Right? Teaching them to obey the death of the When we go out to people groups that we're not familiar with, that's how we understand the gospel better. And so your small groups and your discipleship relationships, if you want to have people mature, you have to emphasize that. Right? If you want to learn, you have to go out. You have to interact with different people groups. And the you know, best way to do that, honestly, in the summers, go overseas. Because you jump a bunch of barriers at the same time. Right? You're going to jump the age barrier, you're going to jump the language barrier, you're going to jump the culture barrier altogether. I encourage you guys to do that. Okay. I don't know how many small groups I've ever been in where the, the leader really, really encouraged missions in the small group. But not, but not just to go, all right? Because I know some of you guys have different kinds of situations you can't go. But to support and to care for the shares. There are different, a lot of, especially this church, we have a lot of people going out overseas all the time. We really take time to learn about what they're going through, right? Understand what their needs are, how you can pray for them, how you can support them financially. <clears throat> I'll tell you, when I was going to college, this fellowship really blessed me. In the last, last I went back, I've been going on missions for about seven years. I never been once short of money. I've never once had to find a ride to the airport. I never once like couldn't find a place to sleep before I go to the airport or somewhere to stay, something like that. This church is always important. You guys are not my age. <laughs> right? I guess we learned this all over again. My generation did it on purpose. 
right? Mitoplasmia is a harvest of blood and death. Mitoplasmia is a harvest. Understood, hey, when the impact goes on missions, let's go with it. And now we're on this missionary. So I want you guys to learn that too. All right, I'm telling you, when I was going through it, it helped me so much. When this fellowship understood it, it helped me so much. I want you guys to feel the same way. So here's the tips. <clears throat> Encourage short term missions in your small groups and establish relationships. Learn about short term missions yourself. Two trips coming up in summer next year. We're probably going to go to either Thailand or the Philippines in the summer. So talk to me about that. And we always go to Shanghai in the summers. So if you guys want to go to Shanghai, Thailand, or Philippines, let me know. If this is another country I didn't cover, I can probably find out how you can get you there. <clears throat> Discuss it actively. Pray to see if that is where God is leading you. All right? You have to talk about it. Don't keep it to yourself. All right? I know you guys have to Facebook like random things, but <laughs> use Facebook for good. <laughs> Understand that every Christian is an evangelist, and this is not you trying to do so. Here's a saying. All right, I just say it's, it's part of the truth. Because it's historically been true. You know how you're called to missions? You're called to missions if you care about opportunities about missions. That's how you're called to missions. If someone in your church or your fellowship stands in front of you and says, hey, we need people to do such and such, who wants to go with them? You know what that is? It's calling. <laughs> Alright, it's someone asking you. So we have to sit there and be like, oh, I don't know if you're asking me about missions. Someone just did. Someone came to the front, looked at you and said, come on missions. You're like, God, oh, you called me? <laughs> It's like, I don't know if he's looking at you and he's just asking a question. <laughs> hey, mission, mission trips are not easy to set up. Okay? If your church has them going on, if people are asking you to do it, look, it's super hard to set up. It's not easy to get done to the church. See that opportunity to take advantage of it. That's not. Encourage giving of time and money. This is especially for small group leaders, disciples, leaders in the church. All right? If there's someone you're helping to grow in Christ, this is important. That would be the work that God is doing. <clears throat> Here's the hiding about value. Okay. I go to I go to Eunice. I'm like, Eunice, it's Christmas. I want to do something really nice because you're gonna do a great job of harvest. Right? Here is a no-name purse that I found at you know, that is that store. It's just like, uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's made like a weird texture, I thought it was <laughs> Alright. Or it's like Candy's bag, okay. <clears throat> and then I go to the units, I got to show you this cool canvas bag. Oh, canvas. It's Louis Vuitton. I said, oh my god, it's Louis Vuitton. I'm like, it's Louis canvas. No, it's Louis Vuitton. And I'm like, it's a girl. <clears throat> Why does she value Louis Vuitton more than like no name brand? It's because somehow we add value to this brand of Louis Vuitton, right? Like, like the look, way it looks, like that, there's value added to it. It's not the material itself, but it's what we put in it. Okay? How do, you, how do you value your time and money? Okay, what is, what is the Louis Vuitton in your life? I think about this here. Okay, what does it put a lot of money to you? What does it put a lot of time to you? You know what ends up being in young people's young adults lives? Car. Yeah, I'm going to save a lot of money, I'm like, that's value. Alright, what does it mean a lot of time? A lot of guys who go crazy, I'm going to spend a lot of time with my girls, because girls are value. Right. That has a value. You know, if I get a hot girlfriend, man, yeah, life is good. <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. Right? In 30 years, that car you've seen up for, is that going to be cool? No, it's not. Okay. I used to work at LA Fitness, and I saw like Ferraris in the 80s. I'm like, that was cool at one point. <laughs> and not so much anymore. I'm still driving. Okay. Value missions. When you think about things that are, that are worth your time and money, all right, I encourage you guys to teach people why missions is worth your time and money. Make a difference with your money. Give rides, provide housing, store stuff. Be creative. All right. Missionaries will come up to you with a lot of different needs, especially these guys who are you know, a small church you know, like us. You'll, you'll figure out real quick what people need. <clears throat> when, when Virginia asked guys in Virginia, when she was in Shanghai, it was really small stuff. She's like, David, can you buy me your plugs, uh, contact solution, and like a book or something like that? I'm like, all right. That's what it meant to support Virginia. Right, next time I went to Shanghai, I brought her the contact solution right here place. <laughs> Sometimes it's just finding out what someone needs in their life, okay? But it has to be a priority. You have to prioritize giving your money, giving your time, giving your mental energy to missionaries. Okay? 
Next slide. <clears throat> Be a part of someone supporting and follow up with them. Read people's prayer letters. Okay? Some of you guys have never received prayer letters yet because of new college. You guys will get prayer letters. What prayer letter is, is it tells you <clears throat> why they're going to receive or why they're doing a certain ministry. It tells you what they need, how you can pray for them, and how you can support them. <clears throat> Read them. Alright, some of them, when I've been written well, they like to text. Okay, just take three minutes of your life and read them. Alright, more than that, ask them about it. It feels really good to us when you ask us about our prayer letters and support letters. The worst I should do, one of the worst things I ever got in my life, was I was, I was sharing about, you know, missions and what I do for a career. And then someone gave me a prayer letter too. She was, uh, she was talking to somebody, and like, someone like giving her some information about her, her about the website or her name or her number. And she tore my prayer letter up and wrote on the backside, right? Like someone's website or something like that. That is so painful. Let me tell you why it's painful. Because what a prayer letter represents is your dreams. It really is. Right? Because as a missionary, you sacrifice a lot of things. You know, I sacrificed being a raw star. Alright? <laughs> 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 I gave that up to follow this dream. This dream I found on his paper. And so I'm basically giving you my dream and telling you what it is. And someone's like, all right, I can set up a website on it, all right, google.com. I'm like, really? <laughs> 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 really? All right, read who for that. Don't spend the sidelines in your church and community to do something. You know what that means. All right, don't expect it. Make it a part of week to see how people are doing overseas. <clears throat> Our China missionaries, I figured out, break the great firewall. All right, we'll be on Facebook, we'll be emailing you guys. Hey. It's up to you guys. You guys have to follow up with people. All right. When you see your friends serving overseas, when you give up people in your church supporting serving overseas, hit them up. You know, if they have a phone number, call them. If they have emails, email them, Facebook them. I right, see how they do it. All right. It's really lonely. When you're overseas and no one emails you back or talks to you back, it just it feels like you're forgotten. Make it a part of your life to do that. Especially small group leaders, especially disciples. Make it a part of your discipleship because people will learn unless you do. People, especially new Christians, will not learn it unless they see you do it, unless they see you, you know, act out your lives. Because that's how the church has always grown, right? Young people, all the freshmen and sophomores in here, learn from these older guys. If you guys do it, the people, then those people will do it too. Some resources. Last slide. Okay, bye bye, Bob. Jesus, amen.